everyone to um, our first Lunch and Learn as part of our um, Women in Software Engineering series. To anyone who's new to our events, um, Women in Tech Republic is a third republic employee-led effort that is made to challenge the gender imbalance um, that exists among software engineers and other technical roles. So our mission is to connect, inspire and develop the careers of female technologists um, in order to make technology a more diverse and inclusive working environment for, for everyone. So our vision is all around empowering um, community members to be change agents in the world of tech. This afternoon we're joined by Sarah, who is a um, software engineer over at the company Lilium. And um, yeah, she'll be talking about the, the fundamentals of clean code. Um, I'll, I'll pass over, I know she'll be introducing herself. Without further ado, pass over to you. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for being here and joining us for this Lunch and Learn event. My name is Sara Figueiredo. I am a software engineer at Lilium and today I'm joined by Sarah Johnston, who is a senior software engineer also at Lilium and she's going to be uh, helping out answering any questions that you might uh, come come across with. So thank you so much Sarah for also being here. Yeah, so here's what to expect from this uh, from this meeting. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about myself. I'm going to talk a little bit about Lilium. And before we jump into the uh, what exactly clean code means, I think it is really important to understand what the gravity of bad code is in, in any organization. Uh, we're going to have a little chat about who to blame exactly when this happens. And, and then, yes, we'll jump straight into what exactly is clean code, some of the fundamentals, examples, and ending up with, um, with a Q&A. So a little bit about me, uh, without um, boring you too much, uh, I'm Portuguese. I studied uh, computer engineering in a university uh, in Aveiro, which is like uh, our little Venice in Portugal. I have a master's degree in, uh, in computer engineering and my master's thesis was about social robotics. And what I mean by that is how robots can actually help to improve the quality of human life. So I developed a dialogue system, which was to, um, which was a client server application that helped uh, uh, children with autism to improve their communication uh, skills. And yeah, little references. So three of my uh, top books, of course, I had to include Clean Code by Robert Martin. If it wasn't for this book, if it wasn't for his knowledge, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I will pick up examples as well from the book uh, during this uh, during this uh, event, and yeah, again, uh, I I thank I thank this book for a lot, and then some of my other all time favorite uh, books, and yeah, apart from being an engineer, I'm also an actress, and this is just a little picture of me on stage on a little production of the Buddy Holly musical, playing Maria Elena, the Buddy Holly uh, Buddy's uh, wife. So. Before I jump into clean code, I had permission to, to give you a few words uh, about Lilium and what we do. Lilium is advancing how the world moves. We are building the network and the service to define a new era of electric flight. And the, the goal of Lilium is to be the global leader in regional electric air mobility. So our first product is, um, is a seven seater electrical vertical takeoff and landing jet projected to offer the highest capacity and lowest noise in the market. What initially Lilium will basically operate uh, routes between a network of uh, cities, enabling you to travel much faster than existing high speed uh, alternatives and at a comparable price as well per trip. So the beautiful note is always zero operating emissions, which is one of the reasons they actually brought me to Lilium was uh, their values and their what they what they do for the planet jumping straight into the uh, the reason why we're all in here let's understand a little bit of what is the gravity of bad code so many many times and sadly i've been through this um a company has got like an amazing application that it, that is used by a lot of clients and what happens is that after multiple releases and multiple updates, we keep forgetting the bugs. We keep forgetting to, to clean up our code. And 
what happens is that this brings frustration, not just from the client point of view that starts feeling those bugs, but also from a development point of view, because it's so hard to man maintain our code as soon as we get to a point that is just, it's just so messy. Um, and it's also really hard to bring in any new features that the client might want. And sadly, what happens is very typically when we ask any of the engineers what happened for a company to actually get out of business, they usually say very similar things, which is that they had rushed the product to market. They had made a huge mess in the code and they added more and more features, but the code got worse and worse until they simply could not manage. And this is the sad reality that, that, that tends to happen. So the truth is bad code can bring an organization down. So why do we let it happen, right? Why does this happen? And I'm pretty sure that all of us have been in at least, at least one of these cases, right? At any, at a certain stage in our careers. First stage is my boss would just be angry if I would have taken more time to clean up my code, right? Um, because the client just cannot wait. The client eats the feature at a certain time and this brings stress and, and the boss doesn't understand that clean code will make the client happy as well in the meantime. But we have that pressure, so we just don't have the time. So we just have to respect, right? And we just sadly have to say no. Second case is I'm tired of working on the program and I wanted to just get over with it and just get into coding a more interesting module. I mean, who hasn't been in this, right? I've been in this scenario because I just didn't understand. I didn't know any better. So I just cared about my code was functional. That's all that matters. Let's just move forward. And even today, even today, it requires um, the mentality to just stand strong. No, let's go back and let's think in terms of organization and cleanliness of the code. And the third case would be, I just don't feel like cleaning up the mess, so I'll just push it for later. So until some magical day and that magical day just never happens. And this is, um, this is why we see this happening in the organization because it could be, it sounds like something so simple, right? Just clean code, but it, that's not the reality in many, many companies. And now here's a question for you. And I'll, I would like for you to please um, use the chat even to answer uh, some questions that I will have throughout this event, by the way. Please use the chat and let me know who's to blame. Who's do you think, who do you think is to blame in this, in this circumstance? Everyone? The developer, mm -hmm. the product, the product manager, <laughs> yeah, the product owner. Yeah, you see so many different opinions already. And, um, and here's the truth. Everyone is to blame. So Ellie, you're right. Organization culture. Yeah, everyone, everything is to blame because it's not just the responsibility of the developers to fight for it and be professional. It's the responsibility of the, uh, of the organization to give us time to focus on this and to understand this. It is the, the responsibility of the client to also understand that it's not just the you know, external box that they see. It's also what is inside that is, you know, supporting everything else. So thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to have more and please feel free to use the chat. I will, I'll be, I'll do my best to pay attention. So generically, I've told you that an organization can go down, right? But what in terms of the process of an organization, what exactly is happening? What happens is we keep adding features. We keep adding bad code. So the mess is done. We don't have any time to fix it. And as this mess is accumulated, what happens is our productivity decreases and the organization notices it, not just us developers, not just the team lead, uh, not just the architects, the whole organization will notice that the productivity uh, decreases. And here's what happens. Seeing the decrease in productivity, um, the management adds more resources. This is a very typical scenario. And those resources, um, well, we think that it might, sometimes it actually works, but most of the times it just makes things worse. And the reason why it makes things worse is that these new resources, they have to do double or triple the effort in understanding the mess that we have. And then it makes it worse if we don't even have good documentation of our, of our project. Meanwhile, other people leave and the new resources don't know what to do. And as more bad code is being added to the pile because the client cannot wait, the business needs to make money. So what happens is the business needs money 
more features are added to this bad code pile and even harder is the job to clean it up. So there's this constant need of heavy code refactoring, a constant need of delaying the refactoring because the clients can't wait and because we are not given the time to do it or we should have started earlier. Sadly, this has happened to me. It has happened to me that I was given, um, my team was given um, a very strict deadline, right? Very, very strict deadline. But we were told that we were the only team that they trusted that we could do this. I mean, they probably said that to the previous team as well, but they said that to us. We are the only team that they trust we can do this. And, I, and we are like, okay, a team that had amazing, um, amazing code standards, right? So I learned a lot at that team. And what happened is that recognizing that the deadline was really strict, we, of course, we fought for a bigger deadline because we understood that to do what they wanted, we needed more time. Um, and they refused. They refused to give us that time. Um, we tried again. They refused again, even with clear arguments like this will happen. We told them if we do this in this deadline in the future, we, you will ask us to do this new feature and we will just not work or we will need way more time. But they still refused to give us the time. So you can imagine what happened. What happened was that that project uh, was never live because it happened exactly what we told them would happen. And this is a sad reality that tends to happen more in bigger companies, um, but it exists, it is out there and probably you have experienced it as well. So here's a really good example that I found. Think of the client as a patient and you are the doctor. You as a doctor must sterilize yourself and your tools before you operate, which will take extra time, even though the patient is complaining about the time. You being a professional doctor, you have to defend your work because you know the importance of the way things are being done. And it would be very unprofessional of us as developers to bend to all the wheels of the manager who might not understand the risks of making a mess. And I really, really like this example. And, and I think it's so true because clean code is, is a sign of professionalism. And even you will see now in examples that it's not as easy. It's not as easy and it's subjective, but I think we should really have this in our minds. Phil, a few personal notes before we jump into the examples. It's not about pointing fingers. So if you are in a team and if you see code that it's just horrible in your mind, just please don't point fingers. Um, first step is to acknowledge uh, that the bad code is the team's fault. It is a collaborative effort and you should just start a conversation. That's the most important thing to do. Start a conversation and, um, and see where it goes. Nothing is perfect. So please do not end up on that, um, on the, on that uh, aspect that it, you just seek perfection all the time because that will never happen. It's just okay to move back and then change code because code is changeable. That is how it should be. And we must fight for learning sessions to teach the management the benefits of clean code. I think this is what is missing most in especially big companies. Right, so before we go to clean code, who would like to turn the microphones on and answer me? What do you think clean code is? I mean, I guess there's multiple interpretation uh, definitions of clean code, but one of them is um, code that's structured well enough for someone else to read it, like someone who's just literally joined, joined the team, a newcomer can read it and go through the flow without having to check multiple, yeah, like yeah. looking for documentation and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, what is your first name? Sorry. Uh, my name is Fatima. Fatima, yeah. Nice. Thank you so much for your answer. Yeah, yeah, the, you're, you're right. You're right. Um, I, I can also read, it's not spaghetti code, yeah, easy to maintain, easily manageable and changeable code, I think, yeah, clear comments readable. All right. Um, so here's the truth. There are probably as many definitions as there are programmers. That is the truth. The truth. It's so subjective what clean code really means. We've all come across the, uh, the rules of the, regardless of the programming language, right? No duplication, single purpose functions and classes, expressiveness. We've all come across these. And then there are other rules that are just language specific, right? But the truth is there are probably as many definitions as there are programmers. And it's so subjective that it, it will depend. It will just depend on the team. So I like to say that 
for me, Queen Code is, for instance, um, I'm reading code and it's like reading a book and everything just makes sense. I mean, how many times do you come across a module that you need to use for your application and it's and it's well documented or it's just doing what is expected to do? How often does that happen, right? Or how often does it happen that it's the other way around? It's just complicated, right? You just cannot understand this module very quickly. So let's jump straight into what I wanted to push as the first principle. The boys, the boy scout rule, leave the campground cleaner than you found it. Imagine what it would be like if every single time you're developing a feature or you're just changing the code. Imagine what it would be like if you just spotted something that is not readable enough or you think should be done in a better way. Imagine what it would do to the company if you just changed it or started a conversation rather than just leaving it as it was, right? In weeks time, the, the, the code would, wouldn't just be as messy and it doesn't have to be a complex change, right? It can be just, um, I don't know, it could be like a variable name. A variable name may be something else that makes more sense, right? Because if you came across this code and you didn't understand what it did, the chances are there's going to be someone else that's going to go through the same. So there's never going to be a perfect name that everyone, you know, understands, but this maybe there's a better one, right? So what about breaking a function that's just doing far too many things, right? What about eliminating a little bit, just a little bit of duplication? If every one of us did this, that would be so much better for the, for the company. We wouldn't end up with a huge mess of code. And if we ended up having to refactor the code, maybe we didn't even need any resources. We could do it because it's just simpler and more and more readable, right? So that is the first rule I wanted to go through. Second one is let's talk about comments. I read in the comments, um, I read in, in the chat actually something about comments. So let's take these two examples, right? Now, one on the left and the one on the right, um, you can see it's a very simple change, but which one would you rather come across? The left one or the right one? Second one, yeah. One teacher told me it's like writing a poem. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Right one, yeah. So we already have more preference on the right one. Right, right, yeah. So, and the reason is, here's, here's one thing that I learned about comments. They are evil. You shouldn't use comments at all costs, of course, there are exceptions and I'll go through them, but we should think of comments as the failure to express ourselves via our code. If you ever come across the need to write a comment, I would, I would honestly say just stop there and just think if you could make your code more expressive. Maybe it's just a variable name, maybe like this one, this example, you just need to uh, move this code into a function that is that just tells you what it's doing. The employee is eligible for full benefits. I mean, that's understood. So if you ever need to write a comment, stop and think, okay, what can I do to avoid this at all costs? And the reason why is that we as developers, we're used to changing code, but would you change a comment, especially if it was done by someone that has left the company like ages ago, even, would you change that comment? That, that is subjective, right? Maybe you would. Okay, maybe you would start a conversation. That's better than nothing, right? But we are used to changing code, not comments. Comments are hard to manage. So avoid them at all costs, I would say. And here are some ex exceptions. Corporate coding standards, so copyright, of course. Um, regular expressions that specify a search pattern, right? We we would probably benefit with some examples in the form of a comment when we come across these. To do comments, I would put a little bit of an interrogation mark in here because I used to do comments uh, when I'm developing a feature just so I don't forget to do something before I submit to code review. If they end up in code review, what it means is that I just couldn't find a way to solve it and I need to start a discussion on it. Or there's a ticket that I already created that will, you know, that will tackle this. But I only use to do comments for my own, um, for me to remember, 
because you know IDEs just have like this sort of task list and you can just go through all of them and and yeah and slowly uh, tackle them or for instance javadocs in public apis is also an exception of comments let's jump now to a quick question please write on the chat what do you think is the ideal number of arguments in a method or a function maria said zero Oh, Marie, you said you prefer the left one. <laughs> That's interesting. Again, it's subjective. It really depends. Um, anyone else? What do you think is the ideal number of arguments? Depends. Yeah. Three, four max. Okay. For sure, less than five. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The less, the better. Yeah. Good one. So, yeah. Cool. So here's here's what the uh, the common answer seems to be. It's Andre, your quote, so it depends, but as less as possible. So zero, zero is the ideal number of arguments. We should always aim for zero. And the reason for this is one, it makes a function easier to read with zero arguments. And number two, it makes it easier to test because if you are testing a, a function that has so many arguments, you need to test all the possible combinations of the arguments all the possible values that that function can get right so always aim for zero of course there are again exceptions and one exception for instance is if you want to ask a question about an argument for instance does this file exist right we need to pass a file something that represents the file so that is acceptable um another is um another is for instance um two arguments in a Cartesian, for instance, points, because that's what we expect, right? We are not going to create a point with just, you know, one value. We need two values. Um, Sarah is saying, don't be care but, but be careful with zero arguments. It does not mean use global state to avoid an argument. Yes, yes, so true. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, so again, of course it depends, uh, but try to aim, try to aim for for the minimum number, really ask yourself the question, do I need, do I need another argument? Do I really need, will this make this function readable? Will it still be understood? Uh, what about separation of concerns and clarity in terms of that? Yeah, all, all these questions. So um, it's a hard job. It's a really hard job, but it, at least we start thinking, you know, we start really bringing that into our standards. Now, moving forward, think about this, um, think about this little code. Over here so we've got a little function uh, that checks the password and uh, we have two parameters a string username string password and what this function is basically using is it's just trying to match a username to a password so probably already the name of the function should be something else right because check password okay that is very generic right but we are actually trying to match a username to a password so first of all yeah the name maybe should be better now here's another thing that this function is doing that is wrong can you please spot it and, and, and write on the chat? Not returning early. Yeah. All right. So it has a side effect of creating a session. You nailed it, uh, Karine. <laughs> you nailed it as well. There's too many things. Yeah. Yeah. So you're all on a good on a good point. So on a on a good on a good way. So basically, whoever decides to use this, check password has absolutely no idea unless it's documented, right? <laughs> no idea that it's also going to initialize a session, which is dangerous because whoever is using this um, is basically unaware that that person, he or she could be killing a current session that they've got. And then that's not the only problem as well. Another problem is this creates um, a coupling. This creates uh, a coupling that means that this function can only be used as well at, at, at certain times, only when the session needs to be initialized, right? So there are many, many other things about this function that we could, of course, tailor. And someone has, has mentioned, uh, mentioned the return. So Dave, yeah, not returning early, you know, we could do so much work on, on this function. But the, I think the most serious right now is the session initialized. That is not even clarified on the function name. So there are two things that we could do here. We could change the name uh, to something like, uh, okay, match username, password, and initialize session, but I would be very careful with that. 
because we should aim for a single purpose, right? So if we want to initialize the session, we would probably separate this into another function. So whoever uses this function will not be misled, right? Um, and um, and if we separated, we would then get rid of that uh, temporal co uh, coupling that I mentioned, which means that we could we could call the check password as many times as we wanted without worrying um, about the session, right? So yeah, thank you so much for your answers. Yeah, this is really this is really interesting. Let's jump to another one: meaningful names, right? Now, why is it hard to tell what this code does? So we've got a class, class one. So probably was the first class that this person created, right? Uh, but what does it do? Um, a, a function called get them, get what, right? Um, okay, um, an array of int, um, something, right? But but get what? Um, what does it mean in my domain, right? And then we've got a list one. Okay, but what is what am I? What is happening here, right? And then for x in the list that we, we cannot, what is this list? And then if X at position zero equals four, what does this mean? What does zero mean? What does four mean? And then we add to that list and we return it. But, so it's just simple code, right? You can see this, this the indentation, the indentation is right. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, loops in here. And it's just, it's just the names, right? So now let's have a look at the second, the second one. Okay, now we've got a minesweeper game and we've got a function that is called get flagged cells. Okay, and then we have a list called flagged cells and for each cell on the game board, okay. Okay, so there is a game board. Um, and now we know exactly what the zero and the four mean because we, we created these constants that are readable. So cell at status value, even this could even be improved further, right? That, that's the thing. There's so it's so much open for discussion and then but if a cell at a status value equals flagged then i'm going to add it to the flagged cells that makes so much more sense and you can see that the simplicity stayed the same we didn't add any more loops it's just variable names um we could even improve it further right we could maybe this could be a class right a class representing a cell and then do something else inside of it right there's so many more, more things we could do but the most important thing is for you to realize that the previous example, we just, I couldn't understand it. If you could understand it, honestly, <laughs> I salute you. Um, I, I just couldn't. And then this second one, okay, this makes sense. And, uh, and it's, again, there's something else I would like to say. Naming variables, naming classes, naming directories. Most of our jobs, most of our job is to name things. So why not learn? how to make this, you know, these meaningful names. We keep naming all the time. So as I said, there's functions, there's variables, there's classes, there's directories, there's... So stop and think uh, about a better name, you know, and, and start a conversation. If you're if you're in doubt, you know, ask a colleague, like, what, what do you think about this name, right? Just at least start a conversation. Now, let's go to, um, let's go to another, another case. Error handling. I couldn't just leave this meeting without going through error handling, right? Just at least one example. We we know that um, functions should do just one thing. So functions should do one thing. So this is a good, I mean, it could, again, it could be improved. The names could be improved. I mean, feel free to use the chat, honestly, to just attack this piece of code as you want. <laughs> uh, but one thing I like about this code is that the delete function is is handling the error. There's, it's not doing anything more. It's just, okay, we can only see a try catch block in here. Uh, yeah, the try tries to do one thing and then it catches an exception. Of course, we shouldn't, we should be careful with catching um, exception. We should be specific in this case, right? We should always try to catch specific exceptions, but that's not that's not the, the case in the, what I really want to, to, to get your attention at is that this function is only doing one thing, handling the error. And then the delete page and all references is doing everything else. And, it, and even the name is, is very meaningful because we know we're going to delete the page and also the references. Okay, cool. I will not worry. I don't have to worry about the references then. So cool. So functions should do, should do one thing and error handling is one thing. So I would really advise you to keep this separated as well. It's just so much readable and, and then your error handling will, will improve massively by just following the simple rule. 
Another one, classes should be small. I mean, have a look at this class, right? We have a class that's called super class, all right? That extends some other super class, uh-huh, and implements an awesome contract. I mean, okay, what is this supposed to do? How am I supposed to, to use this class? And then if we go one by one, we can see that, okay, many, many me functions or methods that they deal with different things. Some will deal with statistics, other will deal with the current presenter of something, right? How many boring slides do we have? Uh, uh, Boolean, I mean, functions that return a yes or no, um, things about the session, things about a simulation, right? Okay, whoever did this class, um, honestly uh, didn't think about separating things a little bit, right? We should probably have, first of all, a different name, uh, but here's one thing. If you cannot be more concise about your class name, then that means that it is probably doing more than it should, right? So if you cannot, I mean, I couldn't, I would have to say this and this and this, you see, so session data and uh, present, uh, presenter data and simulation, right? It's too many ends um, and it wouldn't just make sense. And we are exposing public methods, right? So whoever uses this class, I mean, is it well-documented? I mean, if it is well-documented, at least that, right? But it's just too much, right? It, 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 it's too much uh, and harder to maintain. Yeah, separation of concerns, single responsibility. Honestly, we can have we could have a lunch and learn just for single responsibility. We could have a lunch and learn just for every single example I've been telling you about. Because there's just so much we can we can say, right? Right. Single responsibility principle. Let's remember that. Let's try to separate things. It will honestly you will thank it. You will thank it later. You will thank yourself later. Now another thing I couldn't just leave without talking. Testing unit tests and rules of thumb. We know how important it is to have tests in our application. Some people are still getting used to the test driven development that you just test first, you write your test first, and then you write the production code for that test in order to make it pass. Right. Some other people prefer to do the production code first, but there's 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 improvements in production code if you follow a TDD approach. And I was one of those that I was just, I would just straight in, jump into production code. And, and I forced myself to, to do, to use a more TDD approach. And my code became cleaner just because of that as well. So we've talked about clean code for production code, but honestly, I think it's even more important to write clean code for our tests, because what is the first thing that we tend to do or that we should do when we come across a new system, it's to see the tests to have a look at the test, to try and understand what this application does, and also to see if it runs, right? If the tests pass, that should be the first two things we do. Run the test, passes. Okay, what is this application doing? How can I get to know more about it? So the higher your test coverage as well, the less you will fear coding, right? Because if you do not have any, any test at all, if every time you add a new feature, you know it could bring a possible bug, right? That you have nothing to verify apart from your application being on runtime and you just testing around things or worse, your client figures it out, right? So if you have a test coverage, it would immediately, a good test coverage, not just a 10% test coverage, right? A good enough test coverage. Every time you write code, it will probably detect a bug something is broken, right? So here are the main things. Now, some rules of thumb, readability of your tests. Again, not just for yourself, but for whoever comes across your system. If they understand your test, they understand what your application is doing. Simplicity, again, simplicity um, and, and just in, in both the name and also the structure of your test. Density, I mean, we want to say a lot with as few expressions as possible, right? This comes as well. It's like a mix between simplicity and density, right? It's finding the right balance. Now, I have a question mark in one asset per test. And the reason is because sometimes we end up with far too many mechanics just to get this rule of thumb. So one of the reasons that I put a question mark is that I don't know, um, I mean, maybe to get the asset 
to get this rule of thumb in place, I end up with just far too many mechanics and unreadable tests. So that's why I would prefer the single concept per test. I would favor this over this. Of course, again, it depends, right? Um, but yeah, I would I would go between those two and really ask yourself the question, which one would make more sense in here? Which one would make this more readable? Fast, tests should be fast. Tests should be independent from each other. They are just testing this thing and I don't want to care about any other test is single responsibility again. This is what I'm testing and I, I will not affect anything else. Repeatable, repeatable in dev environment, in QA environment, you know, they should be repeatable in all those environments. And self-validating, they should either return true or false. They should pass or they should fail. Very simple. And timely goes according to what I said in the beginning, that they should be written at a time that, that better benefits our, our production, right? And in my idea, they should be written before the production code for the benefits that I mentioned as soon as we jumped on the slide. You will just be able to cover way more of your production. You will be able to have cleaner code, more well-structured code. Give it a try if you have never tried this. Honestly, at least give it a try. And then you can come back and say, no, I don't agree. That's fine. That's fine. Again, it's subjective. Um, but yeah. So here are some personal notes. And let me have a look at the chat just to see um, if I haven't missed anything. Good tests are your safety net. Yeah, they provide confidence that you can make changes. Exactly. Keep this in your mind, honestly, um, and, and give it a try and, and see how it goes for you and, and for your team. Because it's not just you. Again, it's your team and whoever comes after your team. Some personal notes. There will always be disagreements. Always. Right? But the most important thing is start a conversation. First with yourself. Because when you code, ask yourself the question, how could this be more readable? And then ask, start a conversation with your team. When doing code reviews, for instance, this should have a better name. Or if you don't understand something, that ask why. Why is this here, right? Uh, can, can you explain to me, uh, please? And, and yes, yeah, start a conversation. And then again, with your team or even with yourself, every time you come with, across a piece of code that you think should be cleaner, don't be afraid to change it. Because if you don't change it, you will be part of the problem, right? So you need to really... Uh, have the strength to just change it if it doesn't make sense or start a conversation. There are many, many more examples, honestly, that, that I could go through in terms of clean code fundamentals. Again, the uh, Clean Code by Robert Martin is a book that I really recommend because, again, without this book, I wouldn't be making this presentation and I wouldn't be asking the questions um, when I code and also when I code review. A summary for you, clean code is subjective, but at least start a conversation. Stay professional, invest in clean code, fight for it. Always try to leave the code better than when you picked it up. Think about the single responsibility principle. I cannot say this enough. It's a hard skill to grab, but practice makes perfect. Names are everywhere in software. We do so much of it, so we better learn how to do naming well, right? Or better. Um, Test-driven development and clean tests are a life savior for your production code. And accept that nothing is perfect, but fighting for some perfection is better than staying idle and being part of the problem. So this was my presentation for you, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for that um, presentation, Sarah. That was great. And I think everyone can agree, so informative and, and so helpful. Mm -hmm.